This episode is sponsored by Incogni. Deep beneath the earth, a group of miners cling to life. They are trapped in the darkness of a small tunnel and know that from this location, there's no way out. With no food or water, their last torch died long ago. No one remembers when. They don't even know how long they've been down here. Days? Weeks? It doesn't matter, though. It's the unending thirst, desperation, and premonition of death that torments them more. They need a miracle to survive. None of the trap miners expected their shift would end like this when they entered the Langety Breustedt iron mine shaft in West Germany on October 24, 1963. Miners can't afford bad thoughts. Working deep below the surface in dark, damp tunnels is hard, and these men are tough. But nothing prepared them for the disaster that was about to strike. Some two hours after the start of the shift, at 7.30 p.m., the lights went out in the mine. Then the conveyor belts stopped working. Nothing to make a fuss about, as similar things had happened before when someone pierced a power cable. However, a few minutes later, a strange gurgling noise started to echo through the corridors. It grew louder each second. Now this was a reason for concern. A train driver in the pit was the first to discover the torrent of water and mud. A sedimentation pond above the mine collapsed and broke into the tunnels between the 200 and 330 foot levels. 18 million cubic feet of muddy water started filling its tunnels. A nightmare scenario for the miners. Most of the miners ran toward the nearest and only escape route, the ventilation rises. Built primarily to provide airflow to the underground tunnels and regulate temperature, ventilation rises were equipped with ladders due to safety regulations. Thanks to this feature, they became the sole lifeline that led to the surface. Up there, the management had already set off an alarm. Someone managed to send the emergency call from the mine before the telephone lines broke. The entire site was mobilized. There were men down in the pit that had to be evacuated. Also, the leaking pond had to be sealed as soon as possible. Heavy trucks unloaded tons of rubble and wooden blocks into the pond, hoping to plug the hole and stop the flow of water into the mine. Management ordered all air compressors to keep working at full power to supply compressed air to any survivors trapped underground and stop the water from filling the tunnels. By nighttime, the water stopped rising thanks to the high air pressure built by the compressors. As the workers on the surface fought to contain the disaster, miners kept emerging from the ventilation holes. Of the 129 people inside, 79 escaped. That meant 50 men were still down there. With the mine flooded, survival chances dwindled. But miners leave no one behind. The battle for the lives of their co-workers had begun. Within five hours of the accident, the management formed a command and control team to rescue the trapped. Heavy equipment necessary for the rescue operation started to arrive from neighboring pits and other parts of western Germany. Apart from not knowing if there were survivors, the crucial question was, where should they look for them? The search began with survivor statements about where the miners were when the water broke in. Engineers used floor plans to identify potential refuge spots. The best option at that moment was to drill randomly at specific locations. Every hour counted in rescuing the trapped men, so taking action was better than doing nothing, and they were indeed right to do so. Already the following day, after three drilling attempts, rescuers located seven trapped miners. Once contact was established, the group informed the control center that the water level dropped and they would try to escape on their own. Without the knowledge of the command team, a group of miners equipped with searchlights entered the flooded site to meet their trapped friends halfway toward the exit. Ultimately, the group escaped with the help of a makeshift raft. With seven people saved, there were 43 to go. Of that number, management estimated that no more than four could have survived the flood. They believed they took shelter in a possible air bubble inside the cavity 260 feet below the surface. Was there any hope for their rescue? Pinpointing the exact location of the cavity from the surface was difficult. Rescuers had to take guesses. For two days, teams performed search drillings to find any sign of life. After making each hole, they would lower microphones on ropes and listen. 
there was nothing but the noise of dripping water that they could hear. Then, on the third day of the rescue operation, the drilling team heard a distant knock. There were people down there, and they were alive. The estimates were precise. A group of workers was indeed trapped in the air bubble. There were four of them initially, but one had drowned. After they escaped to an elevated part of the corridor, the three men built barricades against the incoming water and opened the valves of the compressed air pipes. Luckily, the water eventually stopped rising due to overpressure, and the miners were left with a small portion of the tunnel where they could wait for rescue. There were no words to describe the relief they felt when the tip of the search drill appeared over their heads. After three days without anything, the trapped miners received drinks, food, light, and clothes from the surface. However, it wasn't over yet. They still had to wait for a large bore drill to make an escape hole. Finally, the drill broke into the tunnel on November 1st at 4.30 a.m. It was a tricky procedure as the team had to be careful not to disrupt the overpressure in the air bubble. Just in case, the miners withdrew to the highest point of the tunnel. Around noon, a specially designed rescue capsule called the Dalbush Bomb was lowered into the mine to assist in the evacuation. Inside it was a rescuer tasked with helping the trapped miners enter the 15.2-inch wide capsule. Even though the end was near, the recovery operation was not easy. The men had spent a week in a high-pressure air bubble, causing a lot of nitrogen to mix into their blood. If they returned to the surface too quickly, nitrogen bubbles could form in their bloodstream and cause life-threatening decompression sickness. That was why rescue drills were fitted with a chamber that prevented the loss of pressure. After being successfully withdrawn to the surface, all three miners spent three hours in the chamber undergoing a gradual decompression. The operation's outcome was more than successful. The trio were saved without severe injuries and sent home to their families. A little later, the director of the rescue operation released the drilling crews and rescue teams, telling reporters, it is impossible that there is something else. The rest of the mine was underwater, and hardly anyone could survive a week after. The destiny of the 40 remaining workers seemed sealed. It was believed that they died in the flood, and it would be difficult to recover their bodies. The Lingity staff and the rest of the country were mourning the miners. Not some of their co-workers, though. Miners never give up. They believed there was a chance more survivors could be saved. Were they suggesting there was room for more miracles? Not according to the site director and the head of the rescue operation, who had lost faith after scanning the entire plan of the mine and finding no room for more air bubbles. They didn't know what the miners knew. There was one more place where workers could hide from the flood, the Old Man. This was the name for the old mine, which opened in 1860. After decades of mining in this area, it was eventually abandoned. By 1963, it was a crumbling chamber with rotten support structures 160 feet underground. Miners persistently asked to search the area, but the director was adamant that finding any more survivors was impossible. However, it turned out that he was mistaken. When the flood began, a group led by Bernhard Walter started to run. Soon, they found all their exits cut off. The abandoned section was the only place left to hide. Yes, it was dangerous to go there, as the ceiling of this section was highly unstable. However, there was no choice. And so, Walter and his colleagues ran inside. The water followed them, but only to a certain point. Unfortunately, not everyone managed to escape. Once the water level stabilized, the men began to assess their situation. They were trapped in an old, unstable mine with no food or fresh water. Luckily, they had their helmet lamps. It was easier when they could see each other. But as time passed, one by one, the lights went out. As Walter later described, they could do nothing in that moment of misery except huddle together. The two bodies floating in the water just a few yards away intensified their distress. These were their fellow miners, men with whom they had shared the joys and sorrows of their work, and now they were dead. It also reminded them that it was just a matter of time before they too could suffer the same fate. The fear and the darkness drove them mad, 
so Walter had to work as a mediator during fights. After some time, the stress even overcame the feelings of hunger. The thirst, however, was agonizing. They didn't dare to drink the water because they were terrified of corpse poison. The suffering escalated when people began to experience hallucinations, envisioning being safe in their homes, preparing for bed. With the perception of time completely gone, they were uncertain about how long they'd spent in this underground abyss. The only clarity the miners had was the chilling realization that as each moment slipped by, the odds of escaping were growing smaller. Up on the surface, a final farewell was already organized. The funeral service was scheduled for Monday, November 4th. As the village prepared for the funeral, a few persistent miners kept pressing the director to drill above the old mine. Reluctantly, the director gave in the day before the funeral, under increasing press scrutiny. He agreed to make a final attempt, stating that it went against his better knowledge. The problem was that the intended drilling location was on the railway tracks. Without belief in the success of the operation, the team moved the drill a few yards to the side and began the process. It turned out that luck smiled upon the trapped miners. The team accidentally hit the spot. At 6.45 a.m., after three hours of drilling, they heard repeated knocking signals from below. Everyone was shocked. There was no time to waste for celebration, though. The men had been trapped underground for 10 days and desperately needed help. Drill crews, rescue teams, and doctors who had left the site were ordered to return. Through an inner hole in the drill, 2.2 inches in diameter, a rope with torch, paper, and pencil was lowered so the miners could report their situation. There were 11 survivors in the old man. Sadly, boulders falling while the tunnel caved in had killed 10 miners. The second shipment was more generous. The miners received small bottles of drinks, pure gold for their tormented bodies. Throughout the day, a special tube was installed, sending down a supply of essential items and food. Their calorie intake gradually increased over days as they received light, low-salt meals. In anticipation of the operation, they received protective equipment and assembled shelters against potential rockfalls. Paradoxically, the most stressful period was yet to come, a four-day wait for the rescue drill to finish. If the Lengada disaster were to happen today, smartphones would arguably be among the first things to be sent down. They keep us connected, but they also hold all our personal information. The more time you spend online, the more likely it is that someone, somewhere, has your details. That's what I'd like to talk about. Today's sponsor, Incogni. Every time you sign up to a website, you are likely to accept the terms of service. But when was the last time you thoroughly reviewed one of those? You may have consented to your data being sold and resold to hundreds of data brokers. This includes personal information such as your name, gender, location, and even your address. This could lead your inbox to being flooded with spam emails, robocalls, or worst case, someone stealing your identity. This is where Incogni comes in. They reach out to data brokers on your behalf and request all your data to be removed. Incogni has already removed 40 threats identified with my information and still actively searches to remove more. Simply sign up using my unique code, Dark Records, create an account, grant them the right to work for you, and the automated system will do the rest. Protect your online privacy today. Incogni is offering a 60% discount to the first 100 people using my unique code, Dark Records. You can find the link in the description below. Thanks, Incogni, and thanks to you folks for supporting us content creators. Finally, on Thursday, November 7th, the rig reached the tunnel of the abandoned Old Man Mine at a depth of 183 feet. The Dahlbusch bomb was lowered with two rescuers to support the evacuation. By the end of the day, all miners were brought to the surface. Bernard Walter was the last of them to leave the old man. The shift they started on October 24th ended after 336 hours. The brave survivors were ecstatically welcomed by their families who had mourned them just a few days before. Everyone wondered how those men survived for two weeks without food and water. Years later, experts claimed it was only due to the low temperature of 55 degrees Fahrenheit 
and extreme humidity of 90%. The saved miners never forgot how their colleagues fought for them when they were left with nothing but hope. Their comradeship birthed a miracle in Langity. Watch this episode next if you found this video interesting. Please add a like and leave a comment if you want to support the channel.